Okay. So welcome back. We will uh, handle the question which uh, uh, Samuel had put up. I'll just read that question for you. Uh, he's, um, he's written, uh, do shed some light on physical punishment for disciplining, spare the rod, does it still apply to modern day parenting? Okay, um, I'd like to give you some principles of of this, but before I say that, um, I I, you know, I quickly put up certain uh, verses in scripture, and for the benefit of uh, those who who are unable to see the chat, I'm just going to um, bring about what those verses are. So there's Proverbs thirteen twenty four, Proverbs twenty three thirteen. Proverbs 29, 15, Proverbs 22, 15, all talks about um, not withholding discipline from a child. Uh, and some of them even talk about how the rod gives wisdom, uh, that uh, the one who spares the rod uh, you know, hates the child, but the one who loves him is diligent to discipline. And that uh, you know, Proverbs 22, 15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So this is, it's, it's not an obsolete practice, okay? And um, we need to know that the principles that scripture talks about are timeless. And it's something that can be used, was used when uh, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit till the point of time that uh, that the lord jesus comes back to take all of us right there is nothing that is obsolete in the word of god uh, so uh, using of the rod is something that is still a practice that we are encouraged to do however let's be careful of how we use the rod and maybe i'd just like to bring up some principles so that we also have a perspective of um, how a rod is to be used okay so First and foremost, um, I, I think a principle of always giving a verbal warning first. I think the enforcement of physical punishment, physical like using a rod or physical discipline should come only after words have not done their job. So the physical means, yes, uh, correction, um, uh, of using, using some kind of a a punishment, a physical punishment should be, and I think should be appropriate in cases of clear disobedience. And there again, only at certain ages. Okay. So it's a, it's a means of correction, which could be appropriate in, um, in clear disobedience. Like for example, not when, and, and I've seen this happen so much in, in, you know, maybe in the culture I was raised up in, you know, a child falls down, right, and the mother gives him a good spank. Or the child is lost somewhere, and the mother gives him a spank. Or, you know, the child drops down something by mistake, and he gets a spank. Okay, so those are means of, um, I think, unreasonable uh, discipline, unreasonable using of the rod. Okay, so, it, in, so I'd say first, there is a clear verbal warning, okay, with significant... Uh, uh, areas of disobedience and also maybe only at certain uh, stages. A second um, a principle that we could look at is when we are using the rod, we are uh, hoping to establish some responsibility to own up to that misbehavior. Okay. And uh, instead of why it is ask, instead of asking the question, why did you do that? because it does not help them claim responsibility asking what did you do wrong right so if i were to give you an example let's say a child has done something wrong uh, so the mother's asking okay jean what did you do wrong so i may say nothing you know my friends called me to play out with them on the street so maybe my mom says okay um you know what did you what did you do wrong uh so so the the child says, I want I went because they called me. So the, my mother may ask me, ask me, you know, why what did you and I talk about? And then I may say, I'm not supposed to go uh, when you ask me not to go. So then my mom probably asks me, So what did you do wrong? So the what is I disobeyed you, right? And so when you're able to establish that there is um a, a specific 
uh, you know, they're, they're owning up to the fact that they have been disobedient to you and that, yes, maybe disobedient requires a set of punishment or something that you may need to face. Maybe it is a it is a spank or it is some form of a punishment that may need to come. That's where, you know, you it should establish a responsibility to own up that, you know, I did that. I disobeyed you. And because I am punishing you because of your disobedience, not because of um, you know, of the fact that you were out playing. It is because of the disobedience in itself. So establishing that before you use a rod. Some other principles is avoiding embarrassment. Uh, so um, using the rod in front of, you know, a whole gang of people, in front of the church, in front of the entire home, in front of the friends, can do a lot more of damage and it'll be very hard to undo it. So discipline, especially using the rod, should be private, should be done maybe at the four walls of the room. Okay, this using of the rod should be in a place, uh, should, uh, uh, should proceed where the parent communicates what has grieved them over the act, okay, over the behavior, and not over them as people or as a person, that the grief is over their behavior and not over the person, you know, and often uh, uh, we sometimes see, you know, uh, uh, parents do punish saying you're a bad boy or you're a, you know, you're a, you know, using certain adjectives, terms, negative terms for the child rather than for the behavior. You know, I am displeased with your behavior. I'm displeased with your disobedience. I'm displeased with uh, uh, with the fact that you you lied, okay, more than you are a liar or you are a cheat. You are someone who is you you st you are a burglar. What whatever, right? So it is the act that really matters. Um, another thing of of using the rod is when you spank, you are spanking not to injure, but you're doing so firmly and often one spank is good enough. Uh, and remember, as I said it, it is not to throw out the parents' frustration. It is a show of discipline over their behavior, uh, over their, the act that, is, um, uh, that, that has gone by. So often just one or two maybe firmly is more than enough. And I'd say choose a place to spank. So it should definitely be bottom downward you know back of the bottom till probably the thigh downward and you know research has also said do not use the hand to spank use you know a certain rod or a stick or whatever that that is specifically there to spank and of course it is not spanking i'm saying this again is not effective for those who are preteens and above so by the time they are 11 and 12 and above it should have progressively diminished, okay? And of course, not uh, uh, not appropriate for those, for maybe children who are two uh, years and below. And there also, when you're using the rod, it can be done differently. You know, even even uh, just uh, just a very firm hold of the hand of a of a uh, of a toddler, like a two or a three year old toddler's hand, is maybe enough to uh, show. That, that that is a form of discipline, okay? So not encouraged below two, definitely should be progressively lesser after uh, they are 10, 11, uh, and maybe diminish completely after they are a teen, okay? Uh, I think one of the important things when we use the rod is to know, is to look for repentance. Uh, and uh, that's what you're going to engage them and look for repentance, uh, relate the discipline to the specific behavior, and also come to a place where they're able to make things right with, with, with the person who they've offended or, or with God himself. And lastly, is to show love, is to go back, um, you know, take them in your arms, explain to them that that is your responsibility. And, and this is not after beating them with the belt and turning them black and blue and uh, all kinds of color and then going back and saying, I'm, I've done that with love, okay? It is, it's when you, you have that one or two firm hits or firm spanking in the bottom for, and explained 
you know that this is because of your disobedience this is because of um, you not having um, uh, obeyed what was your verbal instruction this is why this has come and then once that is done you know restoring back going back uh, and showing unconditional love by either a hug or a um, you know or a or a communication that that is extremely important i hope i answered your question i don't know if i answered too much uh, samuel yes yes pastor yeah okay all right Thanks. okay all right so we'll we'll uh, go on i think we've um, you know we've covered a couple of points uh, as we've spoken so i'm going to go on to uh, page um, uh, page 162, the last point where we are at increasing responsibility with autonomy. Okay, so uh, what when we're looking at discipline, we're also we also come to an understanding that um, when children mature, uh, there there is also we also give them certain freedom to make decisions. Okay, but so with increased maturity comes increased freedom and comes increased responsibility so as per, as children grow parents also need to gradually give up that sense of control without giving up involvement you know you give up control but don't give up involvement so your involvement should move progress in this way it should initially be instruction, maybe at the initial stages of their uh, childhood, when they are probably, you know, the school going age is instruction, you know, you do this, uh, you know, give them things to do, uh, how they can do it, and make then as they get into their tweens, that is their 11, 12, 13, you make it more participatory. Okay, uh, see, this is the way that I do it, would you like to follow me in doing that? Two, moving into a place of influence, that is at the teenage ages, you help them see that, you know, I think this is a better option. Would you like to follow? Would you like to do that? What is it that you think? So your your involvement or the way that you uh, you deal with them, you engage with them should move from instruction to a form of participation to a form of um, uh, influence. Okay. And uh, so what you're doing is you're slowly helping them build their own uh, ability to take things um, responsibly, responsibly in their own hands. So you, you, as they mature, you give them more responsibilities. Thereby, you have you give them a lot more of freedom. So even as we're talking about freedom, there are maybe even boundaries that you may need to institute, especially in some areas where complete freedom may not be given. And I think some of them could be the use of the internet, the use of, uh, uh, of technology, the devices that they use, uh, and also the way that they socialize with friends. So being able, like, like we had spoken about, being able to explain those boundaries and to be able to monitor it and also to, to come to a place where they are taking the onus of what the boundaries they've been given like for example there is a there is a um you know an instituted boundary maybe that they cannot play for more than four hours and if you see that's gone by you know you should have discussed the consequences that comes from them uh, moving out of those boundaries and being consistent in doing what you've said like maybe if you you when you use beyond your time then you know, some things will be taken off from you till you're able to show responsibility in that specific act. So that's the way that you help to increase that responsibility uh, in their lives. Okay. Now, uh, discipline, when I mean, this is a point that should have come first. So any form of discipline um, uh, can, um, when, when we're looking at children, should come from the both the parents being in agreement to one another. OK, uh, uh, it is often ne uh, seen that, you know, when children are not um, when the parents are not in agreement, children play a terrible game called as good cop, bad cop. You know, and if you know what that is, what that is, children will will soon um, they, they know where are the loopholes in that system and they will begin to um, align themselves to the most favorable parent. Right. 
and uh, you you may you may find that um, uh, they will use the the favorable parent against the unfavorable one right so it is important to understand that parents need to be in agreement to to one another okay uh, so we so uh, which means it is an exercise for parents to come together to understand how they are going to bring about that sense of parenting and uh, i think it's worthwhile here to really even talk about uh, something called as parenting styles and this was a work that was done by a psychologist by name is diana bomrand and she bought about um uh for she bought about different kinds of parenting styles okay and she came to this understanding based on two elements the first one is uh control and the second was warmth okay or rather uh rules and the second is warmth so in her when she looked at these two elements that is parental warmth and parental control she came up with these four styles and if you look at in page uh, 100 and um 63 you will see that in the table there okay so uh, the first one is called the authoritarian the second is the authoritative the third is the permissive and the fourth is the uninvolved so just to give you much more simpler terms on it the authoritarian are the strict is the strict parenting style the authoritative is the more democratic or the balanced parenting style the permissive is the more lenient parenting style and of course the third one is uninvolved which can be the neglectful parenting style okay so in these four parenting styles um she saw how parents approach their children the authoritarian style or the or the strict parenting style there's a lot more of rules okay there's a lot more of control and demands and rules um are are uh, are very very important there are uppermost there there's maybe very little show of love and warmth okay uh, and i think a lot of us can identify having one parent in this in this uh, uh you know in this category where there is the parents are authoritative uh, sorry authoritarian where there's a lot of strict discipline maybe not too much of a show of warmth and affection that comes by okay and it's 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 seen that children usually um who who are raised as a from an authoritarian parent style generally become that this is a generalization okay don't don't say why didn't i turn out like that thank god you didn't turn out like this but they could either become extremely rebellious resentful um uh, you, you know being rebellious towards authoritative figures or they could become more weaker and emotionally um more broken and may not have enough of confidence and esteem to deal with the world outside so that's the authoritarian style the permissive style or the lenient style is the exact opposite there are there's a lot of warmth and compassion but there is very few limits and rules right so everything is based on a warm relationship so even if there is there is a uh, there are issues or or you know um, uh, when things are not going when when the child has disobeyed it is often overlooked because they don't uh, they are not high on taking up rules so usually children in this kind of parenting style um tend to become very confident they they may they may be able to take on you know be a lot more exploratory but often become very selfish become quite self-centered may really not know the differences between uh, have a good judgment of things that are right or wrong you know may may be very acceptant of everything and find it difficult to discern all right so that's the um lenient or the permissive style of parenting 
um, the, the next one is called the authoritative parenting style. And this is the style that is often recommended. And this is a good balance between rules and a good balance between warmth, where limits and boundaries are given, yet there is a lot of involvement in the way that they communicate. So it's also called the communication-based parenting style, where boundaries are understood, there is a right and wrong that is given to them, there are, there are, there are discipline measures measures that are given, yet there is a sense of um, uh, building them up in character. So children in this category often grow up to be more balanced, uh, able to make decisions on their own, able to stand good moral grounds of knowing what is right, what is wrong, uh, also knowing how to, um, you know, how to uh, come through pressures. So generally outcomes for authoritative parenting style is much better. The, then the last one is the uninvolved, where you don't have limits, neither is there warmth. And usually this is prob most of the time it's because of uh, disengaged parent parenting, either because there is absent parent parenting or there is neglect or there is illnesses or, um, uh, you know, any form of uh, issues that rise within parents where they are not able to bring about any form of a uh, development for the children. So when we look at these styles, um, the authoritative style is the most preferred style, where there are clearer expectations and involvement that's that's given in, that's in children. So when parents are in agreement with the way that they parent, you know, so, so usually if you have parents with differing parenting styles, um, and you know when when there are uh, um, and when they are not in agreement, it can compound the issue in itself. Okay. All right. The other quickly, we're just going to go through last couple of points. Um, so when we look at dealing with children, disciplining uh, to be to ensure that that there is no partiality um, towards any one of the children. We have examples of partiality in the Bible in itself, where Esau and Jacob. Um, and even jo uh, Joseph and his brothers. And we see the fallout that happens as a result of the preferential treatment that is given to these to these kids, right? Uh, and so that, that needs to be understood that every child should be should have fair and equal treatment from both the parents. All right. So ensuring that there's no partiality. The next point is, um, as, as you bring up and groom children, is to, dis to appreciate uh, what is right. So affirming good behavior and using more positive uh, reinforcement to encourage behavior is most important. A lot of times we find ourselves nitpicking at only that which is negative and not really affirming that which is good and that which is, um, uh, which is needed and which is helpful. So... Make it a practice to focus more on what is well done rather on that which is not well done. Okay, so affirming and appreciating what is right. The next is to be able to handle things when it occurs at the first instance, to, to come to a place of correction when there is a um, there is a flaw or there is a there is a disobedience or something that you see. We see an example of, uh, and that's what's uh, given in the book, which you can take time to read, the story of Absalom, uh, David and Absalom, where he where um, uh, Absalom becomes offended because his sister Tamar was violated by Amnon, and uh, because David was complacent, didn't really do anything about it. Absalom, you know, managed to um, kill his brother after two years and then fled, um, uh, fled for, um, sorry, he killed his brother and he was, he fled for two years. Uh, and yet uh, David never took the time to uh, address that. Uh, and so it is important, we take a lesson from that is not to ignore behaviors or attitudes that we see in our children, because when when we let it pass, when we let it go, probably as, um, you know, as an explanation that this is, this is how life is, or this is how children are, I think it gets to be worse off. So handling things right at the first, uh, first instance is important. 
the next uh, point we're looking at, uh, looking at is not engaging in any kind of pointless arguments. So sometimes when you see that you, you may be getting into a debate, especially with your teens, um, uh, you know, be wiser and uh, pause and put things on hold and not just get into arguments when there isn't when either one of you are just probably talking and there's nothing going on um, inside, you know, put it on hold, come to a place of calmness and then peacefully address the matter. Okay. Uh, the last two points, one is to um, uh, often, you know, when, especially when younger children misbehave or when there are things that are hard, um, it is okay to take some time off because if you don't, you may tend to overreact. You may tend to do things that are not in line with what God wants you to do. Uh, taking some time off, thinking about it, asking God for the wisdom to deal with some situation like that and come back and addressing it is always useful. The last is, like we said in the in the one on, uh, uh, you know, at the last point of the rod is, of course, to be able to give unconditional love, always finish a discipline with love and a place of uh, coming back to a place of security. Um, and regardless of what, um, uh, what has happened or the discipline that has come about, coming to a place of love and uh, uh, love, in closing it up with uh, that unconditional love. If at a point of time you find that you have um, displaced your anger on your child and maybe wrong, wrongly disciplined him, coming to a place of asking forgiveness and acknowledging that you were wrong and apologizing and committing to that you would work on discipline better is, is significantly important. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop here for a few minutes just to check on questions. Okay, I see a lot of chats up here. Uh, okay. All right. So Christopher, uh, Christopher said that there, there is also a legal aspect to corporate punishment in India, Section 17, and the right of children to free and compulsory education. No child shall be subjected to physical punishment or mental harassment. Whoever contravenes the provisions of subsection shall be liable in disciplinary action um, under the service rules applicable to such person. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it also matters how, what kind of physical, and I think I addressed it here, the kind of physical punishment that you dole out on a child. Uh, is it, so I think the principles I spoke about uh, really captured it. Uh, um, Christopher, do you have any other question on that? So I actually, I just, uh, I just, while this was going on, I was actually just trying to you know, also understand some of the legal aspects because I know uh, it may not be in, in India, but I mean, I know in, mm. in uh, some other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, in the US, for example, uh, you know, there are there are cases where children have actually, you know, uh, have been able to, are in a position to take their parents mm. to, you know, to court. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and of course, those, as I said, could be, could, extreme, could be extremes of, uh, you know, corporate punishment. Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to, you know, just. Yeah. You know, just I think it's good to be aware. It's good to be aware. But if we are careful in the way that we approach this, and it, that doesn't become your means of discipline. I don't think that should become a means of discipline. Like I said, it should only be given if there is, uh, if there are those signs of disobedience, you know, those willful signs of disobedience, even after verbal corrections are not meant. And there again, like I said, one, two, good firm ones, below the buttocks, use one thing um, and, uh, you know, come to a place of, again, relationship and only then rules. So all of that, you know, if you can package it, I mean, see it as a pack, uh, I think um, the, the chances of it moving legally is is much lesser. Okay. Any other question? Uh, my daughter's sorry, I'm trying to read that. My 
Oh gosh, my daughter's says it's dangerous for her when mom and dad <laughs> are on the same page. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, they are they are little little monkeys sometimes who know how to play around, don't they? Yeah. Anyway, that's sweet. Okay. All right. So I think I'll go ahead if there aren't any questions. Any questions? Or can I move forward? Yes, Sam. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'll, um, it's, a, it's a concept that I'm struggling with a little bit. So I'll try my best to frame the question. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when, we, when you read a lot of uh, stuff on parenting, uh, and there's a lot, but uh, something that I'm seeing uh, like a common thing, and, th and this is, of course, worldly wisdom, but you know, sound uh, research, like laborious research, which is um, like a, a child's key personality is developed within the first three to five years. A person grows up, and you know, the person is patient, uh, is uh, resilient. Uh, it, it's often traced to that. You know, what happens in the first three to five years is what causes that key character to be built. Uh, similarly, even negative, like if a person is short-tempered or, uh, or afraid to take risk, venture out, uh, versus a person you know, who is more okay to take risk. So all of these is what research says is developed within the first three to five years uh, based on how less or how much the parents are involved and, and how the parents deal with different uh, issues. Uh, so so that being one, and, and we see that like, um, like, for example, my dad is known for being a very patient person. Uh, a lot of, he, he can withstand a lot of nagging, a lot of resilience and still not lose his school. And uh, and I uh, you know I probably bear some of that and and I'm saying like like my mom and other people say like you have your dad's patience so so on one end so so I'm, I'm I think I'm struggling with the concept like uh, these key personalities and you know uh, like some of them are also similar to the gifts or the fruits of the spirit like kindness uh, long suffering so I'm I'm, I'm thinking so i think my my uh, what i'm trying to understand is uh, how much of these character traits are developed in children by uh, by how their parents treat them in, in the adolescent years that's well. um, versus how much is there anything that they inherit from the parents which seems unlikely but then you know it's again uh, really look like a, you know a, a quiet father's son is almost you know often like a quiet person himself so it's it almost seems like a genetic transfer which which is again I think a difficult concept but but so so one is is it taught is it uh, is it hereditary transferred um, and also versus how much of it is uh, you know god given like I think difficult script so anything that you you can share on Okay, so um, I think I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll discuss this in parts. The first thing, so what I think your question basically is how much of nature and how much of nurture is something that builds into a child's individuality and how much of God-given personhood is. I think in short, that was your question. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you, yes, research does say that the formative years, the formative years of the zero to five years are the most crucial for children to build uh, a lot of their uh, initial temperament. And it gets built on in the years to come till they are 18. So secular research says that by the time a child is 18, 20, 21, there is a firm personality that is built. And it is a combination of that uh, which comes from the environment and that which is genetic or which is biological in nature. So that's what research says. 
uh, and a lot of it is something that we see a lot of the characteristic traits that you and i have today is because of what we've uh, what may be inherently in us and also what we have uh, uh, got as a result of our upbringing nevertheless i do want to mention that um, a personality is not ingrained in stone and it's something that we become aware of you and i are aware of our own uh, behaviors our attitudes um, our certain ways you and i are aware which means there is a place where there is a choice of behaving a choice of thinking a choice of feeling you you god has given you that will to be able to change what you may need to for those who are in god in jesus christ we do see the supernatural work of god that changes maybe inherent things in us that have been part of us from the time that we've been born but it requires your involvement it requires your willingness to give up uh, those traits of yourself to god to ask him to mold and reshape and change and work on so even as we are looking at secularly we say that some of the personalities is the way it is and it can never be changed i defer i defer there because we know that every that we that as a human being there are choices that we can make i have a choice if i want to respond in temper or i have a choice to respond calmly i have a choice if i want to um mingle with 15 20 people or i have a choice to stay reserved it's a choice that i have yet do i have the ability to do that maybe not completely and that's where we take the power of the holy spirit to help us in those areas so that's that's what that's how i'd want to answer that i think to help you i i would like to just probably present this i've been reading this book so that's why it's it's here and this is a book called it's called shepherding a child's heart by ted trip i will put a pdf of this book into the onto the stream it's an excellent book to read and he talks about this in the initial three chapters and he says about two things he said you understand a child by number one understanding something called as shaping influences that is all the events and the circumstances that the child has been accustomed to is something uh, that makes the child that's one the second is their response to these influences like maybe some of the influences maybe you're in a home uh, you're in a broken home now that can shape the way that you you uh, you know you are built or the personality you have but it also matters what has been your response to that so if so what he says is if you have a godward orientation if you are uh, if if the child is one who understands their relationship with god as being the uh, up, uttermost and the utmost every other influence is seen through that lens but if as a child their orientation is towards something else is towards other gods when i mean by gods it's probably towards you know fame or name or any other you know any any other forms of idol idolatry it that that is what really uh, um builds their experience of life or their response to life so it's not just what we have been uh accustomed to or what has shaped us but it also matters how we respond to it so for those who believe in god as their savior they see that no matter what these influences are you know they they move forward in life in for the purposes of god but those who may not know the lord as their savior they may take some other god some other forms of idols and shape their lives through that okay and i, I it will be extremely sam i i'd like you to you know take at least read the first three chapters it really gives you a greater insight in understanding that that there is just because of the power that god has in us there can be transformation but of course it needs our willingness it needs the child's willingness or when an adult child's willingness to be able to um, um 
allow him or herself to be shaped by God in spite of the influences or the impact that his his upbringing or his nature or his nurture has brought about for him. Okay, so I will put that up on the stream. Uh, y'all, y'all can take some time to read that. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to quickly finish. We just have another five minutes and just two points that I'd want to bring about. There's a lot of scripture on this on one of the responsibilities of parents is to is to ensure that um, uh, to be able to require obedience from the children through our correction. And uh, one of the verses that I just want to highlight is in Proverbs 29, 15, where it says, correction and discipline are good for children. If they have their own way, they will make their mothers ashamed of them. And we spoke about this verse earlier when we were talking about the rod, right? So obedience is something that is an um, uh, which scripture talks about is to be able to establish in their lives. When, uh, when we when we, we, we when we administer discipline, we are administering um, discipline as um, uh, as part of how we represent God the Father, and, and God the Father wants His children to be obedient to Him. So, correcting and disciplining them for obedience is is what you will see in this entire scripture. So, uh, and through and as an offshoot of obedience, we also see that. Children need to establish order in their lives, to have a certain routine, to have uh, a certain structure in their lives. And because that also helps them, it encourages them to stand in course, to be in obedience to, to not just um, to God, to their parents, but also to a certain discipline uh, entrusted to have. Okay, So um, uh, children... It, Obedience is definitely one of the key things as we bring about discipline uh, in our children. So administering loving discipline is, of course, a part of showing them who God the Father is and uh, who he is to our children. Alongside with discipline, it is also giving them a concept of authority. And Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, you know, talks about uh, about this, about giving a fair punishment and, uh, sorry, fair discipline and how the Lord corrects all those uh, he loves. And that as a parent, we are called to, to build that with the authority that God has given us. God has entrusted the parents with authority and they need, children need to be aware to submit to that structure, to that arrangement of authority that God has given in the family. And um, uh, through discipline is one way that we also do express that. So God gives the parent the authority to bring the children up in the in the ways of the Lord, to bring them up in discipline, bring them up in correction, bring them up in obedience, so that they will be at a place to uh, to obey. Now, what does obedience specifically do? It protects. Obedience is something that protects children for life. It protects adults, uh, you know, children who grow up to be as adults for life, and they grow in that maturity because as children grow and mature. Uh, th- there, there are going to be points of time that they will need to stand in uh, in somebody's um, authority or under somebody's guidance or under somebody's rule book, and it prepares them to come to a place of submission. So, so the parents are the ones who groom them to be in a place of submission towards godly authority and to keep under. Um, the, the umbrella of obedience. So when we help children to be to obey their parents right from the childhood years, what are we doing? We are helping them to obey God and His Word. So obedience to parents will position the children to receive uh, a blessing over their lives because they have in turn, be, uh, in turn, are obedient to God Himself. So. It is important. Discipline definitely equates and uh, brings about obedience with, uh, in the children. It also helps the parents to uh, um, show a, con- a, a, a sign of authority because that's what they have been positioned to do. Parents have been positioned to um, uh, bring up children in in the author- in that authority. Okay. Lastly, uh, uh, is to be able to. 
um, uh, help the children to deal with foolishness by imparting wisdom. Okay, if you look at uh, um, Proverbs twenty two fifteen, it says foolishness is what is bound up in the heart of a child, and it is only discipline or the rod of correction that will drive it away from from him. So, uh, as part of discipline, we know that. Uh, each one of us have been foolish in our own ways. We've been careless. We've not done the right things. We've been influenced by so many things outside. But it required the Lord's discipline for us to come to a place of alignment, right? So it is part of the parent's responsibility to ensure that the children, that you impart wisdom to the children. You impart a sense of understanding so that foolishness is away from them and they walk in parts of righteousness they walk in a place where there are right choices and decisions that they can make okay so in short we've spoken about quite a bit i mean this is this is a this is a power packed uh, uh, lesson where we've uh, looked at how god sees children we've seen an analogy of how they are like arrows that need to be uh, directed and aimed and released we've seen how it is important to be to engage with children differently depending on their developmental stages we've seen discipline uh, how do we discipline in the right way to bring them up in the obedience of the lord and how as parents we are to rightfully use our authority position them in a place of obedience to to us as parents so that they could in turn be obedient to god and his word okay all right, any questions? We have no minutes, but any questions? We could handle maybe uh, one or two quickly and we could pray and uh, close. Okay, so for all the parents out there today, come back with testimonies next week, okay? Either testimony of how your your children were spared of the rod or uh, how you you know you've probably messed up so anything to come back with some stories and it'll be great to hear all right let's just uh, close with a word of prayer uh, may i ask one of my ladies to pray nisha nisha are you there if you're there it'll be great if you could pray Nisha or Rose or I haven't heard your 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 voices. Salome, anybody? Rupa, Simran, all the ladies in the group. Uh, is uh, sorry, I can't. I'm not able to hear. I don't know if you all can hear. I'm. In, I know someone is speaking, but I can't hear. Uh, okay, would one of you please pray, Rupa? If you're there, could you pray? Okay, I don't see any of the ladies here. Um, anyone else? Okay, men, over to you. Would anyone like to pray? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given unto us, all that we've learned. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for teaching us through your servants. Father, I ask you to bless her and bless her indeed. I pray, trusting that all is going to be well. I pray, believing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you all. God bless. No problem, Rupa. No issues. Have a blessed week ahead. We'll meet again next week. For those who have not finished your um, assigned assessments, kindly do so. Thank you. God bless. God be with you.